Warhammer Total War 3 is a game where you can socialize with your neighbors, build lasting relationships, and undertake extreme renovation projects. In this expansive fantasy setting, there are dozens of races to choose from, and any choice is perfectly acceptable as long as it's Clan Molder. Why? Because Clan Molder is the only faction that allows you to lobotomize your own soldiers and genetically modify them so extensively that they turn into a writhing tower of flesh which is simply too ugly to die. Today, we will utilize the power of gene splicing, along with a complete disregard for side effects to create the ultimate life form and conquer our enemies. But first, a word from our sponsor. Gamersups is a company which sells some of the finest legal energy supplements in the world. But perhaps even greater than that is their relentless assault on your ability to be a normal person, because they have invested tens of thousands of dollars into the science of sexualizing plastic cups. Nothing and no one is safe from their reach, but we might be able to take control. Use code REGGIE for 10% off, and if we buy enough products, maybe, just maybe, they'll let me design my own totally platonic and safe for work cup. Thank you Gamersups, now back to the video. Welcome to the snow-covered wastelands of a place which is called Kislev, but which we all know is simply Eastern Europe. True to form, these tundras are inhabited exclusively by 17th century Russian nobility and recently paroled sex offenders. As such, its main exports are bad haircuts, class warfare, and uncomfortable conversations. Submit to me. But perhaps the greatest downside to living in Kislev is that every battle appears to be taking place inside of a used toilet bowl. However, that's exactly the kind of environment you'd expect someone named Throt the Unclean to thrive in. And thrive we will. Our goal is to transcend the weakness of our genetics by responsibly using science to ethically create the perfect organism. The only issue is that the more we edit our chromosomes, the greater our risk of developing this unfortunate condition called genetic instability. It's a pretty mild disorder. Your chance of survival is about the same as getting shot in the head, because because the main symptom of this condition is immediate and rapid physical disintegration. And, if you take it too far, genetic instability turns into explosive instability, which causes your anatomy to detonate on contact with the enemy. We could work on a cure, or we could just push you down a garbage chute and try again. Because by pressing this button, we can literally recycle you. This is done through the use of the growth vat. You can think of it like a compost pile for people. I'm going to try to make a unit with the maximal amount of genetic modifications, and according to my calculations, the chance of doing that successfully is approximately 0.03%. So, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of recycling. But before we can spit in the face of statisticians everywhere, we need a plan to expand our empire. And when it comes to plans, there's nothing a rat loves more than a little cheese. The first step is to go south and capture this settlement. We engaged in a close battle, but thanks to my tactical brilliance, I managed to kill almost everyone in my army on turn one. By Skaven standards, this is considered very impressive. Following this, we spent five turns converting the entire population of Fort Stragov directly into food. The legality of this maneuver is up for debate, but when you physically consume the victim, witnesses, and all evidence of a crime, I think you're in the clear. It's around this time a man displaying every known symptom of the bubonic plague will declare war on you. But you can ignore that and instead focus on speedrunning homelessness by traveling to your capital city, demolishing it, and resettling it on the next turn, using all of your stockpiled food to rebuild it at level 4. Now I know you're thinking, but Reggie, won't your population enter a profound state of starvation since you've used your entire food supply on a fancy building? The answer is yes, but also, I don't care, because by turn 10, we will have access to late game units such as rat hydras, and we're going to need them because Sarina just declared war on us, and after carefully inspecting this balance of power, I've concluded that to be very concerning. So what we're going to do is isolate ourselves inside Hell Pit for 5 turns, and re-emerge with a slightly unfair army. As I waited out the turns, I began to grow worried because we were quickly becoming surrounded by a horde of angry Russian gopniks who wanted nothing more than to redistribute my wealth. Maybe spending the first 10 turns killing my own army, demolishing my capital city, and starving my population wasn't such a good idea. Speaking of bad ideas, Serena decided to channel the spirit of communism by death marching her army straight into my capital city three times in a row. Normally, this battle would be somewhat challenging, however, my tier 4 garrison is actually better than either of our armies, so it was fairly easy. Enjoy this moment while it lasts, because it will probably be the only time we achieve anything other than a Pyrrhic victory.
victory in this entire campaign. With the Ice Queen fended off, we emerged from our chrysalis, now armed with catapults, flamethrowers, and plenty of these bad boys. They might not look like much, but with a little genetic modification, we can give them the Cellular Instability perk. If you're having trouble killing any given unit, simply activate this ability and you'll find the fight a lot easier when your enemy is missing most of their limbs. With the power of quadruped suicide bombers, we were able to expand outward, even completing this quest battle and acquiring Gorich, a unique hero who is 12 parts anabolic steroid to one part everything else. I don't think I can properly explain just how violently this man would kill you, but if you can imagine being pulled apart by meat hooks, then you're on the right track. After a few more turns, we managed to gain some territory, but we were in a difficult situation. To our left was the spokesperson for radiation poisoning, and to our right was an AI doing their best impression of Joseph Stalin. So I bought some cannons for the second army and sent it to defend the western front. Meanwhile, Throt engaged in various battles to the south, including this one, which was not fun, because despite having access to several powerful units, there is a resource which is fundamentally inaccessible to us, and that resource is leadership. In fact, every Skaven battle has two distinct phases. Phase 1, where you actually play the game, and Phase 2, where you spend 90% of your time scanning the periphery of the map in an attempt to stop your units from deserting you at the slightest conceivable inconvenience. Compounding this issue is the fact that Kislev units are objectively monotonous to fight against, because each and every one of them is experiencing a crippling identity crisis where they can't decide if they want to crush you with a mace or shoot you in the neck with a flintlock pistol. This makes them supremely unsatisfying to interact with because it feels like every unit just does the same thing. If we liken a diverse army such as this to a delicious and well-decorated cake with various flavors, then the Kislev army is that same cake after it has been beaten with a sledgehammer to the point of becoming a homogenous sludge. Seemingly, the only units that don't struggle with this brand of dysphoria are the polar bears that will inevitably flank you and rip out your carotid artery, which is a nice touch, but I just wish that having a large mammal violently chew through my neck veins wasn't considered the highlight of my day. So to conclude my unsolicited review of the Kislev race, I give them a 1 out of 10. Regardless, winning these battles put us in a very strong position because we're now within striking distance of the capital city of all of these godless sodomites. Soon, Ratkind will prevail. However, things weren't going so good on the Western Front. Leukemia Man decided to attack my second army. The auto-resolve thinks we're going to lose, but when you're playing Skaven, the accuracy of auto-resolve is about on par with the accuracy of a schizophrenic witch doctor who is covered in chicken blood, so I thought I could take him. But... I was horribly wrong. Because after approximately three minutes of fighting, my Skaven slaves were being violently domesticated. Fucking slaves, get your ass back here! My cannons had been flanked by snow leopards, and my archers were doing this. Ah! Moments like these remind me that my personal battle against autism is not going very well. So, the Great Orthodoxy made a generous contribution to population control on our behalf, but that's okay, because as fast as you can kill my armies, I can make three more. By this point, we had managed to completely isolate Kislev and drain most of its resources. All that's left now is to hire a warlock engineer, run him over to Kislev, and use this ability to produce an earthquake that will destroy most of their walls. You know it's a good earthquake too, because the engineer dies in the process. Following this, Throt besieged the settlement and started starving them out. Once they were looking particularly anemic, we completed an auto-resolve and Kislev was officially ours. Now unrestrained by our abusive alcoholic neighbors, I gazed upon the world map to see what diplomatic opportunities await, and I quickly realized that everyone who isn't a disfigured abomination absolutely hates us. But that being said, we did have some friends, and they started pushing south into Empire territory. The Empire, even in its incomplete form, is strength rank 2, and I want absolutely nothing to do with that. So instead, we traveled northeast and started bullying this guy for looking like a fucking idiot. This man looks like a child, and as it turns out, he has roughly the same combat effectiveness, because when I shot him with a cannon, he stopped moving. Now, it's been about 10 turns since I've done anything extraordinarily stupid, so I decided to change that by purchasing the Clone Warfare Doctrine, which makes all of my Skaven slaves acquire three random mutations. Depending on how successfully they mutate, they will either gain superpowers, or their bodies will start violently self-destructing. This is objectively bad, but also mildly entertaining. Follow Following this, and perhaps because of it, the Empire decided it was time to perform a late-stage abortion on us using the medically correct device known as a mortar battery. With war declared, I shifted my attention south to find five Empire armies absolutely salivating at the thought of bashing my head in. I needed to equalize the numbers, but money was tight, so I just recruited two full armies of Skaven slaves. The plan is to use them to literally absorb all the enemy's ammunition and then tire them out in melee combat.
combat. And before you ask, no, I don't feel bad. Because if they didn't want this to happen, they shouldn't have put the phrase expendable meat shield on their resume. With our preparations now complete, we entered into an absolutely massive battle against the humans, with each side deploying five full armies for a total of over 7,000 people. Victory here could secure us a path into the Empire, and defeat would probably set us back about 20 turns. So here's the plan. Step 1. Use my failed science experiments to physically disgust the opponent. Step 2. Create a formation of people that actually matter atop of this hill and use my poison wind mortars to harass the enemy on approach. Step 3. Have a panic attack from trying to manage 4,000 units. And then the most important step of all, step 4. Locate the enemy leadership and right click on them with Gorich. After about 30 seconds of socializing with Gorich, the enemy heroes display a strong proclivity towards bleeding to death. The battle unfolded and it was utterly gruesome. Within two minutes, the hill we were holding looked closer to a mass grave than an active battlefield, with wave after wave of humans crashing against our line only to be enveloped by a horde of rats and eaten alive. Every so often they would deploy some mortars to try to bombard us, at which point I'd use my rat ogres to absolutely flatten them. It was like watching a truck crash into an occupied hospital bed. Overall, the lines were holding well, and eventually, after 15 minutes of fighting, the day was ours. Sure, every single Skaven slave died, but most of them were so terminally ill that this whole thing could probably be considered an elaborate form of euthanasia. The combined casualties came out to about 4,000, which caused the Empire to drop from rank 2 to 17, and we went from rank 14 to 45. Real nice. Definitely feel like a winner now. In the wake of this battle, Throt was able to plow deep into Empire territory, expanding our borders like an errant stream of piss. This caused just about every human in existence to declare war on me. If I focused my entire military in this region, I might be able to hold the lines, but the issue was that this deranged proto-human was still alive and destroying my settlements to the north. I redirected two armies to deal with him and eventually managed to trick him into leaving his capital city, which I then attacked. If we use the auto battler, we'll probably lose, and that's because using the auto battler is a lot like smoking crystal meth out of the barrel of a loaded shotgun. It's convenient and exciting, but sometimes just not worth the risk. So we did this fight manually and absolutely decimated his garrison with our mortar teams. This was basically a death blow to his empire, and I found killing him so personally satisfying that I saved the replay so I could cherish and relive this moment forever. So let's regroup here. Our objective is to create the perfect life form, and I've tried. In fact, we're on the 11th generation of test subjects. However, it's hard to justify spending valuable resources on a project with a 99% chance of giving my soldiers brain damage. So until we defeat the Empire, we're going to focus on just creating good soldiers rather than trying to brute force a perfect one. For example, I worked out a rat ogre build where I replace all of their skin with mammoth hide, replace their blood with high octane gasoline, and force them to ingest a parasitic worm that causes them to become undead. This, along with a few other minor procedures, effectively turns them into unstoppable killing machines. With the Russians now defeated, we can focus these monsters entirely on the humans. The campaign was going pretty well, and the whole experience reminded me why I love playing Skaven. The ridiculous contraptions and absurd strategies make you feel like a cartoon character, but with gore turned on. Not only is it possible for you to slowly flatten an elderly woman using a mobilized bell you dislodged from a nearby clock tower, it's actually one of the more normal things you can do. So needless to say, the Empire was feeling the pressure. So much so that they ended up calling in their friends for help. And what fearsome allies did Carl rally against me? Well, a fucking tree and a short guy. I don't think Carl has many friends, and he's about to have even less because his barely animate companion just ran headfirst into an army of flamethrowers. Meanwhile, the dwarves actually killed one of my armies, which is really unfortunate for them because now I have to introduce them to Rodney. With most units, there is some part that isn't dangerous, but with Rodney, everything will kill you. He's covered in spikes, his entire body is swinging and gyrating around wildly, and if any part of him even touches you, it could best be likened to being hit with a bag full of cinder blocks. So anyway, they died. After assimilating the resources of Carl's friends, our faction had become so powerful that beating him up was starting to feel like beating up someone with cerebral palsy. And as I'm sure you know, after a few minutes, that experience becomes very unrewarding. But I refused to let the physically disabled rob me of the joy of victory, so I decided to fire another bullet into the still twitching corpse of morality by spending a thousand gold to develop biological weapons, which I then deployed in Carl's capital city. This was not tactically necessary, but it was kind of 
of fun. I enjoyed watching it spread through his territory, decimating his economy, and slowly decomposing all of his armies. The plague was so virulent that it even started killing the French, which caused them to declare war on me. I viewed this as a win-win scenario. I had fun watching Carl writhe around on the ground like some kind of dying centipede, but I decided it was time to put him out of his misery. I went to Altdorf, sacked it for 30,000 gold, and then settled it as a level 1 Skaven city. That's a pretty humiliating way to lose your capital city, and I wouldn't be surprised to see a notification about Carl Franz dying of a drug overdose on the next turn. With the old world now under our control, I began pumping my soldiers full of mutagens, hoping that even one of them would transform into something other than a burden to society. The next 20 turns consisted of slaughtering the French, growing new monsters in a petri dish, and having a member of the Chinese mafia try to extort me for 3,000 gold. I said no, he said I'll kill you, and then I pointed out he's 3,000 miles away, checkmate Jackie Chan. Just to prove a point, I also decided to ambush one of his trade caravans, which was carrying 11,000 gold. I know the sight of me grabbing a civilian's head and slowly crushing it with my bare hands looks bad, but it's actually okay because these people are communists, and what they need most of all is freedom. And, as an advocate of freedom, I am morally obligated to extend to them the compassionate hand of freedom by balling it up into a fist and punching them in the face with it repeatedly until they submit and conform to my political ideologies, which is a roundabout way of saying I just wanted 11,000 gold, but I digress. After countless trips to the recycling bin, we were on attempt 28. It was promising. We got him all the way to 10 augments. All I have to do now is administer the ultimate mutagen. What is the ultimate mutagen? This is cum! It's basically a loot box of chromosomes, because it gives him three random mutations. I crossed my fingers and performed the procedure. It was a success. Joey28 officially had eight mutations, which gave him a total of 17 augments. According to my research, this is the maximum amount possible. Or maybe I just made that up, who knows? Regardless, I think he's perfect. So ladies, like it or not, this is what the ideal male physique looks like. A badly mutated rat man with mammoth skin, diabetic neuropathy, propane sweat glands, and some some kind of brain parasite. Have I broken several international laws in the creation of this creature? Yes, but in the eyes of God, I am amongst him. Because Joey28 is the perfect organism. And he's arrived just in time, because it is officially the end of the world. The wild hunt has begun, and the wood elves have decided the best way to protect the environment is through homicide. Two sets of wood elf armies spawned at the enchanted forests in my territory. They look pretty formidable, but I know a thing or two about wood elves. You have to avoid fighting them on their home turf. In fact, fighting wood elves is a lot like fighting children. You can't just rush into the kindergarten winging haymakers. It's not tactical, it lacks nuance. In my experience, you'll find a lot more success luring them into the parking lot where you can ambush them with your friends. So that's exactly what we did to the Wood Elves. I had a few armies wait for them to leave the forests, at which point we cleaned them up in a nice open field where they couldn't pull too many of their tricks. This whole wild hunt thing isn't so bad, I thought out loud. Well imagine my surprise when, on the next turn, I found a conga line of war criminals making their way into my territory. Yeah, that's like 10 armies, with more being pumped out from these forests every turn. I mobilized my forces, but in the meantime, the Wood Elves were destroying pretty much everything south of this line. I don't know what fascist dictator is responsible for this, but I really don't like this version of the Wood Elves. Fortunately, the Old World has a high concentration of castles, which slowed them down, and after a few turns, my armies began sweeping through the war-torn regions. I was engaging them in two to three battles per turn, and Throt was doing fine, but my weaker armies were being devoured alive by the feral elves. Thankfully, I did some experimenting and found that the Wood Elves are surprisingly vulnerable to having a cask of acid smashed over their head, and that's very good news for us. I had my armies outfitted with some of these mortar teams, and we started making making some real progress. Additionally, I had some allies in the area that were able to defend the Eastern Front. This was quite helpful, but perhaps the biggest break was this random event. It increased our chances of ambushing the elves, which allows us to position our armies like this, and their army assumes the position of a man who is about to receive a violent prostate exam. All I can say is that this was an extremely cathartic experience. From here, my military philosophy is as follows. I have 60,000 gold, and I'm guessing the wood elves do not, because upon reviewing their economic infrastructure, I found only mud huts and strange men tweaking on crystal meth. Therefore, I don't believe they can keep up this pace, so I'm going to enter a financial deficit to field just enough armies to gradually grind our enemies to dust under the assumption that they won't be able to replenish their ranks. Over the next 10 turns, I managed to slowly claw back my territory from the elves. I even had time to quell a rebellion from Krakronid of the Black Chasm. Who is Krakronid of the Black Chasm? Only the finest collector of level 1 archers in the entire world. And this? 
I had to congratulate him on personally. By this point, we've unified our eastern, western, and central fronts, effectively pushing the Wood Elves back to this choke point. Around this time, my allies declared war on Vlad von Karstein and asked me for help. Confused and clearly busy, I said no. In hindsight, this was the wrong response, because apparently it was a social faux pas on par with pouring lubricant on a wheelchair ramp. Within two turns, the entire world was so disgusted by my actions that 17 different people cancelled their trade deals with me, including Vlad, costing me thousands of gold per turn. Furthermore, a couple others just outright declared war on me. So needless to say, we're on our own from here. With our armies now unified, we pushed through at Helmgart and even repelled 1800 elves on the next turn. After this victory, the Wood Elves attempted to call time out by issuing a press release that the Wild Hunt was over. Sorry guys, I'm afraid that's not how this works, because my Wild Hunt is just beginning. Briefly regrouping at Paravon, I took stock of the situation. We have five armies, Throt specializing in giant monsters, Snickich with a Assassins, Bok Bok and Ixstone are bringing in the siege weapons, and finally Bilefitch has every known flavor of Rat Ogre. Rat Ogres with flamethrowers, tasers, gatling guns, and even Rat Ogres covered in sheet metal. Comparatively, the elves don't have as much, but they are in the forest, and fighting a wood elf in the forest is like fighting an Italian in a spaghetti factory. Thousands of years of evolution have rendered them perfectly optimized for combat in that environment, so they're still fairly dangerous. The first battle was against Durthu at Waterfall Palace. I I stormed the field with my monsters and the elves adopted this strategy of shooting us from behind a wall, which was smart until the wall broke. I can guarantee you they weren't feeling so smart then. Meanwhile, Durthu was waiting alone at the top of the mountain as if he was expecting a fair and honest duel with Throt. Instead, I had four assassins stab him to death. The first battle was behind us and it really sucks fighting in this environment, so I took a great satisfaction in auto-resolving my way to the final forest. It's being guarded by Orion and a few others, but at this point we have the momentum, we have the numbers, and most importantly, we have Joey. We gave these drug-addled freaks the beating that their parents should have given them 30 years ago. I mean, we really put a pound in on their ass. Gorich, Joey, Throt, it's going to take the Wood Elves years just to learn how to walk again. And as I stood there in a burning forest, surrounded by thousands of dead elves, I knew I had done the right thing, because the Wild Hunt is finally over. Sure, it cost me 10,000 gold per turn, and I'm at war with everyone from the triads to literal demons, but all of that pales in comparison to the fact I have killed all Europeans, become God, and saved the world. I really couldn't ask for a better legacy. And with that, I feel Throt has achieved his goals and his purpose in life is complete. So that's it for this video. Feel free to check out the second channel where I'll be posting some of my extra content. Big thanks to this month's patrons for supporting the channel, and finally, thank you for watching.